That means your heart is connected to what you're saying. You're not just singing songs from your head, from your mouth, but it is coming from a place of knowledge. Spirit and truth. Worshiping the Father in truth means that you are honest about what you are seeking. Hallelujah. You are not seeking something that you don't speak. Amen. Amen. When you are worshiping in truth, you are, you, are, you mean what you are saying. You are not just going, you are not just doing whatever you think. You actually mean what you are saying. You are worshiping in the truth of who he is to you. Hallelujah. Amen. So this morning as we worship, I want to encourage us to worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit, meaning let your worship come from your heart. In truth, be, be honest. Mean what you are saying. Let it be sincere to you that Holy Spirit, I love you. And call upon him. In the songs we shall be singing today, we shall be dwelling on the Holy Spirit and just loving on him. Just pouring our love on him. Just asking him to come down and descend on us. I'm just going to read one more scripture, John 15. John, I mean John 14, um, verse 26. And it says, But the helper, that is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me, and act on my behalf, who will teach you all things, and who will help you remember everything I've told you. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. The Holy Spirit is a gift. When Jesus was going, he said, I will not leave you as offers. I will not leave you alone, but I will send the comforter. When you worship, I want us to worship the Holy Spirit this morning. That's where I'm getting. And as you're worshiping the Holy Spirit, think of who he is. The Bible says here, he is the comforter. He is your advocate. He is your intercessor. He's the one who prays on your behalf to the Father. He is your counselor. He's the one who gives you guidance. Hallelujah. He is your strengthener when you are weak and you say, Holy Spirit, I need you. He comes and he strengthens you. He is your guide. He is your helper. Anything you need, the Holy Spirit is your helper. So this morning, as we sing this song, just worship the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, you are a sweet smell of fragrance. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, you said of us. Just ask that you find us we worship our praise. Hallelujah.
of God now. It's our desire that we get back the Holy Spirit in our lives and yes, in our society. Lord. Amen. I we just going to continue to worship the Lord with this song that says, Awesome God. He is an awesome God. We will praise and lift His heart. He's highly lifted up. Amen.
money or income. You will take up the ten percent. Amen. Before you buy the food, before you buy the nice shoes, you know, before you do whatever, you take out that ten percent. You give back to God. Amen. And then God will bless the rest. Amen. 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 So I want us to remember that this morning that God, may you give me that understanding. May you help my heart to have that revelation. Why do I give back what belongs to you? What's the importance? Amen. So as we prepare our hearts and as we prepare our offering this morning, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we get to come back into your house and bring back what belongs to you, Lord. Father, we ask you that we bless God for the 10% that belongs back to you. I pray for each of you this morning.
Thursday, my children of Bible study we learned uh, from Sister Babs uh, salvation. Uh, I think we ended this consecration, right? Yeah. Give salvation, baptism, up to baptism, yes. So we are in the home and right. We are the home and to start from page one up to consecration. Amen. So that's the homework for the week. Amen. Amen. So that's the uh, those who don't have the booklet, uh, I think we'll make provision, we'll make copies, and then we will receive them on Thursdays. Amen. Amen. But I think you have a soft copy. Amen. So no excuses. Don't come say you left your book at home. You know, I did the homework, but the book is at home. Oh, if you want student, one say to the teacher, I did the homework, but it's in here, it's in the game. <laughs> now, what you see it? What you see it? It's in the <laughs> Amen. So that's the homework for the week. Uh, and then we recently got back from the retreat. Amen. 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 How was it? Amen. How was it? How was the retreat? Peace. How was it? The retreat was nice. <laughs> wow, that's powerful, amen. amen. Anyone who has a testimony, anyone who wants to share with us what the Lord has been doing in your life, you know, this past week from the teachings that we received from the apostle. Anyone who has been downloading, you know, drawing from the box. Anyone who wants to share with us. Amen. Well, I thought there was a hand in that <laughs> That's why the stream was so <laughs> Or should I pick anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Whose name starts with an A? <laughs> with a C? I'll jump the B. With a C? <laughs> I had you! No, I jumped to the B. I went to C. Amen. Amen. But it's been powerful, Amen. We're, we're looking. Oh, this is not about to share something. Amen. 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 Just, uh, well, it's just been the revelation of wisdom was just so powerful. I think I've read Proverbs quite a lot of times, but I never picked out all those nuggets from all the many times. I mean, I've been reading Proverbs, so it was just amazing, um, you know, to understand certain things, you know, as Christians, we take some things so seriously, like the whole anger thing, I really, it really touched me to say that an angry person is basically a fool, um, and you know, when things happen now, I just ignore, like, I'm like, I'll rather overlook that be a fool, amen, it's, not, it's actually a deep revelation I receive from the cat, because uh, before I will, before the time I'll be angry and I'll shout and I'll talk and I'll be like, why are you doing this? But when somebody makes me angry now, I'll just reflect, okay, if you shout and scream at me, you are the fool here. So that revelation really sunk in. Amen. Amen. Good time with great soccer. Amen. But I have this charge against the team of Pretoria. Oh. We were the team of Pretoria oh. when we needed you guys to be. We were there. The second game, we were there. 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 He was playing for Hodge yep. instead of playing for his own team. <laughs> 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 Andrew, you know, talk about a betrayal. Oh, <laughs> 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 Amen. 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 And the people had a great time. I mean, I understood kept hands for our team.
grateful for, for the work that you guys did yesterday for the picnic. Amen. Now we are building our own Italian team. Yes. Oh, yes. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. 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 Even if you only post it on chapter one, read really chapter two, read <laughs> chapter three, chapter four. Amen. Amen. I'll teach you one day. Don't worry. I'll teach you. Amen. 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 Identity. Uh, this morning, I just want to talk about identity 
in our identity in Christ and fulfilling purpose. Now the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, it's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, all things have been made new. Now I often cite that passage often at times as a means of reminding um, ourselves that there is newness that occurs in our lives when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just a minute, let me make sure that you guys are seeing what I'm saying here. Let's see if we can start showing. There you go. So there's a newness that comes to our lives when we, we give, give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We take on a new identity. And us taking us a new identity says that we were one thing before and now we are something else. Now in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, the Apostle Paul says it in this way. He says, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old things have gone, the old all things have been made new. Now, in the process of us becoming a new creation, there are certain things that must change in our lives. Now, in the past when I have read this passage and I have preached out of this passage, I have insisted upon the fact that part of us coming to Lord Jesus Christ is a transformation of our old way of life. A believer, a Christian, a born-again Christian is someone that has taken on a new creation. In simple terms, they are not who they used to be. And so this morning, I want us to examine, amongst a number of things, what changes? When the Bible says that you are a new creation, what does that mean? And of the many things that change, now obviously when you think about Lord Jesus Christ, if you are wearing 80k, you probably still be wearing 80k, right? <laughs> uh, if you had a uh, light complexion or a dark complexion, you will be light and dark complexion. So the things that change are not necessary in the physical. In the process of transformation of character, we become more and more like Jesus. That's why the Bible says that I belong that let you longer to be conformed to this but the process of this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So one of the things that change when we become born again, when we give a life to Lord Jesus Christ, is that our minds need to be transformed. And they are transformed by being renewed. Renewed by what? The word of God. That's why a believer that does not read their Bible is going to be a very lazy Christian. They will not experience the kind of transformation that they are supposed to experience as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the review of your mind means that you are formatting the hard drive. In other words, you are uploading your software. In other words, you are changing software completely. You know? For those of you who are old enough to remember uh, earlier days of of computers, maybe you remember that you used to use Windows XP. Um, and those of you who are older may have used uh, uh, DOS or Linux, I'm not sure. But Microsoft has this habit of changing its software. And with every new software, you know, like the next one is it's a, it's a, it's a programming and coding, with every new software comes new features. And one of the things that happens when you update the software is that if you put the old software on the machine, it starts losing too much functionality, and then with time, they stop sending out updates, repairs. So after a while, it becomes obsolete. You are not able to use the old software on the new machine. Most of the laptops that are manufactured this day cannot use the software that we used in the 90s. Now, a lot of people come to God Jesus Christ, and they do not upgrade their software. They come to church, and they stay in church, and they go to church on a daily basis, but they think like unbelievers. And they act like unbelievers. And so they find themselves straight in the church. Because the church is going to look at them and like, there's something not right with this person. And they feel like, ah, oh, these people are judging them. No. It is because you are trying to use old software on a new machine. There's a renewal of the mind that must take place when you keep your life to Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it says that, behold, all things have been made new. The old creation has passed. Behold, all things have been made new. Now, it practically means that as a believer, you should be able to look back and say, this was my whole life. Now, if you are unable to say this was my whole life, it means that probably that life has not been transformed. And an old life is what? I used to do these things. I no longer do these things. You know, in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we gave my life to Jesus Christ. Um, we had songs that we used to sing that would say, since I gave my life to Jesus Christ, everything changed. I used to be like this, this person, I'm no longer like that. 
Why? Because the prophecy of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, was that he was going to set his people free from their sin. If you have not encountered the Lord Jesus Christ that has not transformed your life, you may still be a religious person and you need to be born again. Because when you are born again, your life is transformed. When you are born again, the life of God comes and inhabits inside of you and changes who you are. The source from which you draw your strength to live your life is not the same like when you were not born again. And because that power is powerful, it has ability to transform you to be a better person. You also get transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You get transformed by the power of the Spirit. When the Word of God is spoken to us as we touch over the camp, how does it change and has it changed us in character? We begin to watch our hand. Because the Bible tells us that after it says in the book, so So that's why you need to read the word, spend time in the word. So there is a transformation of behavior that takes place. There's also a transformation of character that needs to take place. But there are two things that happen which we, that happen when we give our last Jesus Christ, which I want to talk about. One, we take on a new identity, and then secondly, we adopt a new purpose. Now, our identity is who God says we are. Is that visible from where you are? You can read, right? Okay. So our identity is who God says we are. It opens us up to a sense of purpose. Why we are here. When we become born again, one of the things that needs to change is a transformation of our understanding of who we are before God. You know, like we read yesterday from Ephesians chapter 1. We have been chosen, we have been selected, we have been adopted, we have been redeemed, we have been sealed. We are now children of God, adopted, co-opted into the family of God. Now that sense of an understanding of who God says we are, it opens up us to a new sense of purpose. Because I now know who I am in Christ, I now start living my life in a particular way. An understanding of identity redefines our sense of purpose. And a redefinition of our sense of purpose informs us how we live our lives. If you miss out on your identity in Christ, you will miss out on your understanding of purpose and it's going to inform and influence the way you live your life. Our identity in Christ, who I am in Christ, because I am born again, because I'm a child of God, this is how I get to live my life. That's the point of departure. If you don't understand that from where you are, that I am now in Christ Jesus. It's not going to inform your sense of therefore, this is how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to fulfill it. That's why a lot of people live their lives in a sense of purposelessness. They take their sense of identity from the world. The things that they watch on TV. You know, and that is the influence of culture and television. Television defines for us, defines for people who they are supposed to think of themselves. The soapies. Now, there is no evangelist and prophet as powerful as Generations, Mubango, Scandal, Rhythm City, and all those guys. <laughs> they define for our society the sense of right. They define for our society the sense of norm. And then, quietly and gradually, people begin to define their identity from that sense of normality, and then they choose to live their lives in that way. Actually, they just leave. You know, that's how some people end up in relationships that they have no problem for. Because our evangelists have normalized that in our understanding. That's not. But in Christ Jesus, we must understand our identity and we must help us define our purpose. Now, an understanding of our purpose, purpose, and our actions, what we do ultimately creates our identity, you know, our destiny, our future reality. It goes from identity to purpose to reality to destiny. I know who I am. Because I know who I am, I now get to understand how I'm supposed to live my life. Because I now understand how I'm supposed to live my life, the purpose of which God created me, I now define the kind of activities that I'm supposed to be involved in. From identity to purpose to activities, I inform my, my future. Amen. I shape my destiny. Because I begin to live life today, making investments in the way I live my life today for the outcome that I desire. In both this life and in eternity, so in the young life, I decided to give myself pure. To abstain from sexual immorality, out of what and understand of her identity in Christ. That God has spoken through the word that your body is a temple.
step from the Holy Spirit. If you don't belong to yourself, you are bought with a price, therefore honor God to your body. She has a clear sense of identity. And then he also spoke us of Peter and Spirit and tells her, honor God with your body. She now gets a sense of purpose of how I'm supposed to live my life. Because I'm called upon to honor God with my body. And then I begin to make choices on a daily basis. It becomes easier for me to say no. Whenever I send the SMS to say yes, can you eat? I've been listening to you right in the library. I've always been thinking about you. I'm trying to study and I've always seen you in pictures. I can't get you out of my mind. You're like the oxygen that I breathe. I can't even imagine the pattern in my breath. I can't even imagine. Every time I see you, my, my heart skips a bit. <laughs> You see, there's a product that says that since our hunters have learned to shoot without missing, birds have learned to fly without touching. Which is English to say that men have learned to understand feminine behavior over the years and they know what to tell you to get you to do what they want. Not because they are sincere. <laughs> but somehow, 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 they really still like it. <laughs> And that's a mystery to me. I'm going to ask him, Lord, how do you create them? You know, because uh, sometimes you look at them like this guy is lying. But somebody still wants him to see. But our identity in Christ. The security of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give our hearts to be addressed. It's going to help you to make choices that are okay. Because God has asked me to honor you in my body, I'm going to make choices that says no, 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 no. It gives you a communicated sense of practice and then you begin to look forward to it. And it says, Lord, I'm not going to be a I'm not going to be a, a, a girlfriend. I'm going to be a wife. Amen. That's a choice I have made. Yeah. I'm not going to be somebody's plaything. You know, I'm going to be somebody's future. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to be his future. When he sees me and he thinks about the investment and he thinks about the future, he has to see me in that picture. And because I want you to see me in that picture, I'm going to start living my life as the future. So I'll invest in myself because I want to bring something to the table. I'll invest in myself because I want him to be able to value me for who I am, for what I can put on the table. I'll invest in myself because when he thinks about where he's going to, I want him to see me in the future. That's right. So I'm going to conduct myself in that manner. On the side of my identity and my sense of purpose, I start conducting my activities to prepare for my destiny. Because I know who I am. I'm not saying myself short, I'm not saying myself cheap. I'm going to keep myself full. So, to say in another way, our identity is sourced to what God says about us and shapes, us, uh, shapes who we are becoming. Now, in this study, we want to focus a bit about identity and look at into how living from what God says will have affects the way we view ourselves and the world and our values. Now, for me to be able to Good. Now, for me to be able to take the conversation um, to the next level, I want us to look at three biblical examples, right? Three biblical examples of people who encountered God and had a transformation of identity and purpose. Now, turn me to the book of Mark. Uh, if you are there, um, yes, Mark chapter one, verse fourteen to seventeen. Now, our new identity comes with a new sense of purpose. And I want to look at three examples in the Bible. And you will see that from all three examples, certain patterns are common. There was an encounter with God, an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, which led to an understanding of identity. Now, when each of these people met Christ or had a word, there was a communication that says that, this is who you are. 
This is who I created you to be. Before now, I got to this point, you may not have understood who I created you to be. But now that you have this understanding of who I created you to be, moving forward from this point, this is how you're supposed to live at life. Now, that is a pattern that's supposed to be the experience of every believer. Because when you give your life to Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you a revelation of who you are. And it is that revelation that now informs you about how to carry yourself moving forward. There is no way that comes to Lord Jesus Christ and encounters Lord Jesus Christ and goes back the same. Every time any person came to Jesus Christ and accepted His message and accepted Him, he changed and altered the course of their lives. Every single example of people who had an encounter with Lord Jesus Christ. When Zacchaeus came and met the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, Zacchaeus was a man of short stature and that had grown up and had been a very bad person. He was a tax collector and was serving the Romans. He was an enemy of the people. And he was stealing money, chopping money. When he met the Lord Jesus Christ, his life turned around. Amen. Jesus Christ gave a new sense of purpose, gave a new identity. The Lord Jesus Christ says, today, come down from the church that Christ was standing in your house. So Jesus was excited. He told the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, every person that I have defrauded, I'm going to pay back four times. Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus Christ did not leave him the same. Read for me Mark chapter 1 verse 14. If you find it, just read it for Kobanda. And someone else should open Mark chapter 26, verse 4 to 20. Very practical way. 
He says that's uh, the number of the uh, prophet that says that. He says the appointed period of time is fulfilled and the king of God is at hand. Repent. Change your inner self, your own way of thinking. Regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Jesus Christ is saying that. Follow me. Turn your back to sin. Change your way of thinking. Take away from the evil things or the bad things that you used to do. If you used to lie, stop lying. If you used to be an angry person, stop being an angry person. If you used to cheat, stop cheating. If you used to skip around, stop skipping around. All the things that you used to do, if you used to be an angry person, stop being an angry person. If you used to be a jealous person, stop being a jealous person. If you used to be an envious person, stop being an envious person. He doesn't stop at that. He says, change your way of thinking. Regret your past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Something has to change. The way you live, Jesus. Amen. Something about the way you live your life needs to change. It is not just sufficient for you to come to church and sit in church and listen to sermons and praise and pray and go home and not be transformed. Yes, it's great for you to come to church because you get to hear the word of God. Yes, it's great for you to be part of the spiritual assembly where you can be considered a member. Yes, it's good for you to do all those positive things and then you go closer to God. A change! Amen. Let the word of God that comes into your life transform you. And what does change entail? When the word of God comes for you, you need to respond. How do you get transformation? It is through obedience. When God tells you that stop lying, it's not going to come and see your mouth and lie. You need to decide that you're no longer going to lie. I wish sometimes God gave us that power. And you know, some people will stop lying first and they're going to slap every time they lie. <laughs> you know, but when you come, like, you just had a hand and an angel just on your head. And then you walk one like you just hit it. You know, why did you do that? It's because you lied again. No. By the help of the Spirit of God, we are supposed to turn our lives around and put the focus on repentance. And then it does not end that it says, seek God's purpose for your life and believe with a deep abiding trust in the good news regarding salvation. One of the things that we are doing this morning is that understanding of purpose. It says that before you encounter Christ, you are living your life the way you want because that's what's supposed to lead your life. Right? They are completely, totally independent, like an air particle. They wake up. Think about something and then do it. That's it. I'm going to start engineering. Okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to take that here. Oh no, I'm going to travel the world. Oh no, I'm going to do this. Oh no, I'm going to do Completely, totally independent from God. But when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying this first word, there's something that you need to do. If after your repentance, seek God's purpose for your life. <coughs> In the search for God's will for your life, it's you asking the practical question, Lord, who am I? Why did you create me? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And that is a question that every believer needs to ask at confession when you give your life to Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, what will you have to do with my life? When the disciples encountered Lord Jesus Christ here, it says, as Jesus was that's the sister walking by the shore of the sea of Galilee. He saw Simon Peter and Simon's brother, Simon's brother and Andrew casting a net in the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me as my disciples, accepting me as your master and teach and teacher, and walking in the same path of life that I walk, and I will make you fishers of men. Which is the second thing that Lord Jesus Christ requires from all of us. When he says, Repent, turn from your own way, own way, own way, own way of living. Stop doing the things which you regret your past sins and then seek God's purpose for your life. This is now Jesus' encounter with his disciples. And then he goes along and he meets the first set of them. He says that, okay, from verse 16, he says that he was looking at his son, Peter, and Andrew, casting their name for the sea. They were fishermen. Now, Simon, Peter, and Andrew had a profession before they met Jesus. They were busy. And he says, come and follow me. Let me be your teacher. Live your life the way you see me live my life. And then I'm going to give you a higher calling. Something you can what you're currently doing. I'm going to teach you how to become teachers of men. So in so doing, the Lord Jesus Christ was giving them a sense of understanding and a sense of purpose. He's saying that after repentance, and this is an important aspect that we all need to understand. 
After you give your life to Lord Jesus Christ, and after you make a commitment to turn your, your life around, to stop the things that you used to do, the next thing he expects you is to seek the purpose of God for your life. The next thing he expects you is to do what? To come and learn from him. To become a disciple. And when you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the devil says that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach you how in this instance to become a fisher of men. I'm going to teach you how to fulfill your purpose. It's like leave and abandon everything that you are and you have known and have been up to this point. Turn from your ways, turn your back to your former ways of life, change your way of thinking, show regret for your past sins. Come to me and learn from me. I want to be your master, I want to be your teacher. Take up my book and I will teach you. Why is it important for us to learn from the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we cannot please God in our own strength. The bad habits that you want to stop, you don't have the power to stop them. That's why you have not stopped them since so you started trying to stop them. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. But will you take an honest turn to God that says, Lord, I come to you? Read me Acts chapter 26, verse 4 to 20. And the point that we are making up to this point and the following, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you a new identity and a new sense of purpose. Speak up, Uh, chapter 26, verse 4. So then, know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation, the Jewish people, and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, if they are willing to testify to it, but according to the strictest sect, sect of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee, and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Which hope of the Messiah and the resurrection our twelve tribes confidently expect to realize as they as they serve and worship God, God in earnest night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jesus. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So then, I once thought to myself that it was my duty to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints, God's people in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being condemned to death, I cast my bones against them. And I often punished them, making them suffer in all the synagogues and try to force them to blaspheme. And in my extreme rage at them, I kept hunting them, even to foreign cities, harassing and persecuting them. This is Paul describing his life before he met Christ. He says, I was very serious in pursuing after arresting Christians and making sure that uh, I punish them. And then from one of those journeys from the storm, I had an encounter. Go ahead. Verse 12. While so engaged, as I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and conviction and full power of the chief priest, at midday, O King, I saw on the way a light from heaven, surpassing the brightness of the sun, shining all around me and those who were traveling with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice in the Hebrew dialect, Jewish Arabic, saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick repeatedly against the, the gods, offering pointless resistance. And I say, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Okay. At conversion, Paul had an encounter with the Lord by revelation. The eyes of his understanding was open, like we have read in the book of Ephesians. And the first thing he asked is, Who are you, Lord? Now, asking the question, Who are you, Lord, at the point of his encounter, for you and I, it says that the first thing that needs to happen when we are converted is to have that revelation of God at the very 
personal level, the eyes of your understanding need to be open. And the second aspect of that revelation is a revelation of the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ says that you bring yourself to subjection to the authority of God the Father. Paul's eye was open and he realized that he was in front of royalty. His eye was open to realize that he was in front of divinity. His eye was open to realize that he was in front of the core of the universe. And immediately he took up a position of submission and said, Who are you, Lord? Now, I want to say that that revelation of the Lordship of God is the thing that causes the believer to have the fear of God and the reverence for God. When you don't have the fear of God and reverence of God, you will come back to church. Because you've been there you're coming to Pastor G. When you don't have the fear of God and reverence of God, church will be going everything on your phone, playing on your phone, on social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, completely distracted. Because you lack an awareness of the environment and of the person that you have come to encounter. When you don't have the fear of God, you will live your life in any way. Because you think that after everything, you are trying to please man. You will not worry about what men think and say about you. Then you will worry about what God says and thinks about you. Now, as we read the book of Ephesians, one of the things that God kept saying in those verses is, I keep praying for you that the eyes of your understanding will be open. That God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in Him, in knowing Him. A revelation of God must come over the life of a believer that causes them to experience a transformation in their attitude towards God. That's his reverence. <coughs> that's his fear. Now, to give you a human equivalent of reverence, if we had a meeting with President Cyril this morning at 10 a.m., none of us were coming after 10 o'clock. Not one of us. Hello? If we got a message or a phone call from the person sees that says that the receiver of Moses is going to worship with you guys and the person will be here at 10 o'clock. And he wants to switch to everyone of us at 10 o'clock. So people will come here at 6 in the morning. You know? And then make it even better still. We're saying that the president is going to give us checks of 1 million rand for the first come first serve basis. So people will queue here from 2 a.m. <laughs> That's right. Why do we treat God differently? Revelation. Revelation of the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is Lord. You know what a Lord, a Lord is? A Lord means that He has absolute say and absolute authority, and we are subservient servants to Him. And our eyes must be open to that. Because that's what brings reverence. That's what even provokes worship. So it is something that you must pray for for yourself. <coughs> you, you don't come to church to please anybody at all. <laughs> Salvation is something that you want to build, but it's something that you want to get the best of for yourself. So if that revelation does not hit you, go back and pray. In the privacy, forget about men think about you, say about you. In the privacy of your own intimate moments with God, Lord, redeem yourself to me. O open my eyes and me see, like Paul saw, who you are, so that my whole attitude towards you is going to change. You know, I'm not doing this for Sister Babs, I'm not doing this for Mokiwe, I'm not doing this for Samantha, you know, I'm not doing this for France. I'm doing this for me. I want the full package. I want the full experience. I want to be able to know you as well as know you. And I want that sense of reverence to be brought from death inside of my heart and to flow towards you. So that my relationship with Jesus will be authentic. Just the two of us. You know. And it's something that you must pray for yourself. We must keep on praying. Because when our eyes are open to see, then we develop true reverence for God. That's not informed by the man. And you need that kind of fear and reverence for God to last in this thing called Christianity. Yes, you do. 
You think that you have faced challenges? Yeah. When you hit your forties, you will wish that you were young forever. Wait, what? Why? Because you don't pay bills. So, are you saying you have to pay bills in the morning? Mm. Why don't you just get somebody to for you? Mm. Uh, or why don't you just move down to someone? Uh. I am saying you need your relationship with God to carry it for where God is taking you. Okay? Uncle Bernard continues to read. And it's one of the things that stood out very strongly uh, in the life of Paul. I'm, I'm going to wrap up in the next six, seven minutes. <coughs> Verse 16. Get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve as a minister and as a witness, to testify with authority, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to the things in which I will appear to you. Amen. After a revelation of God comes an assignment. After a revelation of God, after you ask the people to see him for who he is, and then he now commissions you. Because there must be revelation and relationship before commission. You cannot be a sinner to the God that you serve. So you must learn it for yourself. And then he comes to the verse and says, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness. So along the journey of our Christian experience, we must come to a point where we have that conversation with God. Where he tells you, Angie, I am appointed you as a servant and witness. Friends, for this purpose I created you. So you I have called you for this and for this. Because for each and every one of us, there's an assignment from God created from the foundation of time attached to our names. But we must go to our eyes and explain up to this point. Repentance, forsaking, abandoning, revelation, encounter, and understanding of the Lordship of God. And then only after that, a communication with assignment. This is who you are. This is who I created you to be. And this is what I have called you to do for me. And he told Paul, get up, stand up, and I call you to be a servant and a witness of the things that you have seen and of the things that I'm going to show you. Our conversion experience in Christ Jesus has to go through these steps of necessity. That's why the encounter with Christ reveals our identity and gives us a new sense of purpose. Now, if your experience in Christianity and your time spent in the work, work of God and in the church of God does not show that systematic kind of progress, then it means that you are missing on key elements of your conversion experience. Either at the place of repentance, or at the place of turning away and showing remorse for your past life, or at the place of the revelation of Jesus Christ and His Lordship. And if you don't have that, each of those on a step by step basis, you will never ultimately get to the place of your assignment. Because it takes the revelation. And in the absence of revelation, the Bible says that one, the people cast off restraint. In the absence of revelation, I'm you hear that, that verse yesterday, the people perish. When God does not communicate to you the revelation of who He created you to be, you will live your life aimlessly, purposeless. There will be no difference between you and the chief planted outside. Both of you just existed. Oh At least the tree fulfilled its purpose. It grew on one spot and provided shelter. So people will came and live. You, you will feel so confused. You will feel so confused. And once ever you are confused, you will be confusing everybody around you. Because everything that is not set aside to fulfill purpose is open for abuse and misuse. So everybody is going to so confusion because you are out of place. You are out of position. So I then submit to you that each and every one of us must get to that place of revelation and understand our purpose. And you will receive it three times in prayer. No, who am I? Why am I here? Why did you break me? What am I supposed to do with my life? And God speaks. And he wants to communicate. 
And the last thing I want to say on this thing is that whatever it is that God has called you to do for Him, He puts you back. Amen. That's what He tells Paul. Read on from verse 17 before you move on. Verse 17. Choosing you for myself and rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their spiritual eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness and release from their sins and, and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified, set apart, made holy, by faith in me. So King Agrippa, I oh, sorry, 18, not 18, it's fine. Uh, read, uh, read Jeremiah 1, that's the last verse we're going to read. Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4. Verse 18, as for one of us, third one. Verse 17 says, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles I am sending you to. To open their eyes and to tell them of darkness to light and for the power of Satan to God, so that they will receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. Paul, in that encounter with God, gets great details about his assignment. And this is what I've asked you to go and do for me. You would go and bring salvation to the Gentiles. So that they will receive salvation by faith and they are going to be together, joined together with those who are being sanctified by faith. And I will defend you among those people. Jeremiah chapter 1 from the state as I close. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah's call and commission. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came during the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. It came to Jeremiah also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, continuing until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and continuing until the exile of the people of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb. Before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. I knew you. And I proved of you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, I consecrated you to myself as my own. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Amen. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I have appointed you as my own. I consecrated you to myself and I put you as a prophet to the nations. Now, imagine having that kind of an assignment over your head and then you want to go and do beauty and aesthetics. Or you want to go and be an engineer. Or you want to go and be an accountant. Let's not look at all the funny things or the, the not so cool things. You want to be a politician. You want to be a president. When God is saying that, before I formed you, are you going to see? He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I had sanctified you unto myself. In other words, before you became an idea in your mother and your father's relationship, you are an idea in God's mind. And God said that we are going to create school. She's going to be my own. Small. Small. <laughs> She's going to be my daughter, my own precious daughter. I'm not creating her or sending her to go and figure out what to do with herself. I created her to be my own. And I'm not just saying that because why? I have set her apart and I have appointed her to be a prophet unto the nations. Now, that is each and every one of us in this place. Before we talk to the mothers who we have known of the Lord, called to be known to Him with a specific assignment. Then it becomes strategic if you do not know that assignment. Because if you don't know the assignment, you cannot fulfill the assignment. If you do not know what the purpose is, you cannot give up because God help us to command it. Uh, verse 6. Then I say, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a young man. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a young man, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And wherever I command you, 
You shall speak. Amen. Wherever I send you, you will go. Wherever I ask you to say, you will say. Do not minimize yourself. Do not say I'm only a young person. Do not say I'm only a woman. Do not, do not say that I'm the youngest in the family. Do not say that I have a weakness. Moses said, I can stand. You know, I can't, I don't look very poor. I'm not a prayer warrior. Do not underlook yourself. Do not look down on yourself. Because the thing that God has called you to do, He doesn't expect you to do it in your hands. So do not look at yourself and then limit yourself by what you know about yourself. God is saying that I just want you to be there. Go where I ask you to go. Say what I ask you to say. I'm not asking you to figure out what you need to say. I'm not asking you to figure out where you need to go. Because I already have that figure out. I will tell you where to go. And I will also tell you what to say. So the going and the saying does not depend on you. It only depends on your ability and your willingness. When God says, Who shall I say? Say, Share my book. Stand. Continue to go back. Let's see. Do not be afraid of them or their hostile faces. For I am with you always. I am with you always. To protect you and deliver you. To protect you. To deliver you. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, hear me. I have put my words in your mouth. I put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdom mm. to uproot and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? Amen. Well, that's fine. Let's turn to something that we're going to pray. I want you to see something that is similar between the calling of Paul and the calling of Jeremiah. Is the Lord saying that I will back you? Do not come and look yourself. You will go where I send you. You will say what I ask you to say. You will do what I ask you to do. I will be who I have appointed to this day to tear down, to destroy, to build and to start. In other words, I have equipped you to what I have called you to do. I don't know what it is that you have heard from God telling you this morning. I want you to talk to God from your own heart. Maybe it's a question of you struggling with an understanding of your identity, who you are in Christ. Maybe it's you struggling in the, with the process of you understanding your own conversion journey and experience, getting to a point where you are able to fully appreciate and have a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to reverence and the share of God. And maybe it's a place of you understanding from your understanding your assignment, looking at your life, your past, your difficulties, the challenges you are facing, and wondering to yourself, you know, why am I going through all of this? And God is coming to tell you that before I go to your mother, I need you. Genesis in Psalm 119, I brought Psalm 139. He says, I praise you because I'm here for you. Psalm 119. I praise you because I'm here for you. And all the things that were made for me were written out before any single one that came to me. God knows you and knows your situation from your past to your present. And He is a guarantee of your future, so your heart can be at rest. And will you avail yourself to the commitment that you have created you to be? Will you ask him with all sincerity, Lord, and give yourself to me? You will not be communicated to me and open my eyes to see what is it that your heart is doing. And at that in obedience, I can respond to you. Can we begin to pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us about our identity in Christ and reminding us about the purpose that we receive and reminding us about the fact that your purpose to be able to be known and to become an enemy. We pray for reverence. We pray for the of our hearts. And for the God that we serve, who we live and why we must honor you. That we owe our position for who we want.